be seated. Good to see you in the house of the Lord today. We are, uh, well, this is lower than most of our minimum attendance Sundays, but the snow fell, so some people probably went skiing, and we know we got people out traveling around, so we're glad you're here because you make it worthwhile for us to be here, so we're just going to open our hearts and minds today to get whatever blessing God has for us, and just feel sorry for the people that miss it, okay? You be sure and do that. Are there any first-time guests here today? I have one young man the first time. Did uh, you get a visitor's card when you came in? Yes. There you go. Thank you very much for filling that out. Drop it in the offering plate later on. If you want to really make an impression, put a check with about $1,000 with it. We'll never forget. I'm kidding. I'm only kidding. Uh, we're always glad to have first-time visitors. We thank you so much for being here. Um, on that board right over there, the cork board, that board is up there for us to put photos of people who are deployed uh, so we can pray for them. It's supposed to be a prayer board for deployed personnel. It's kind of, someone took the sign down a few years ago and it hadn't been put back. But if you're going to be going away anytime in the near future, make sure we get a photo of you to put up there that reminds all the people in the church to pray for you while you're downrange or wherever it is they send you. And that helps us out a great, great deal in remembering to pray for people. Uh, speaking of photos, we have some stuff here I want to show you and I, because... <laughs> So few people are here, I'll probably show them again next week, but you deserve to see these. Uh, after we sent about $3,800 uh, for firewood over to the church in the village in Moldova, this is a picture of them receiving and delivering the firewood. That's, uh, when I was over there, you know, we had about $2,000. They brought it on like just a ton and a half truck. This time with $3,800, they brought a big old long <laughs> haul trailer, and we're glad for that. But that's a uh, picture of the firewood being delivered there to the church. And then there's some, next picture please, dividing it into piles. They know about how much it takes each family to get through a couple of months of winter, so they break it down into piles, and here it's going off to a needy home. Uh, they use all kinds of conveyances to come and get it, and that's a happy man there carrying his firewood. Uh, when I was there, it came in much shorter lengths than that. These people have to do a bunch of studying <laughs> to get their firewood it, but... Anyway, you, church, uh, made that possible, and I just thank you. I, um, I've got several emails from that church and also from Romania. Um, the kids, uh, the shopping for shoes for the orphans in Romania has started. I don't know yet if it's concluded, but I've been promised there will be pictures of that that I can show you in the not-too-distant future. So uh, look, uh, anticipate those things, and uh, we'll be happy to show those to you when they come. You, we have had so much... We've accomplished so much in the year 2014 in terms of missions, in terms of helping people who are much less privileged than we are. We've seen uh, dozens of people in Romania and Moldova come to know the Lord as their personal Savior because of our mission efforts as a church. And I just thank you so very much for letting us be part of that, for supporting us and uh, going with me. Some of you have gone with me, and I thank you so much for that. Uh, we've had a great time, and, and great things have been accomplished because of the faithfulness of this church and the attention we give to missions. Okay, um, two weeks from today, uh, January 11th, we're going to do some things that we normally would do the first Sunday of the month, but because I'm anticipating still low attendance, uh, we're going to slip it to the 11th of January. So on, on January 11th at 10 o'clock here on Sunday morning, we'll have another newcomer's orientation for people who are uh, new to the church, want to know more about the church. We'll do that and uh, provide them some snacks for breakfast, that kind of thing. 
So if you're a newcomer or you know anyone who has not yet been briefed and doesn't know the whole story of Aviano Baptist Church, tell them January 11th, o'clock in the morning. Also that day, immediately following the church service, we'll have our bi-monthly church council meeting. So January 11th, church council meeting, right after worship service, pizza provided for the church, by the church, so you don't get hungry. From now until next Sunday, the office is going to go on what I'm just calling downtime. Uh, Jonna will come in to do the absolutely essential things and then go. Uh, her family's all together and she wants to have some time off and uh, everybody else gets time at work, so we're going to take a little downtime too. That does not mean we're out of reach or out of service. If you need us for anything at all, you call us. We're here to serve you as pastor and family and uh, church secretary, so if you need us, call us and we'll respond. Uh, the phone numbers are on the front of your bulletin, so take that with you. And if you need anything at all, we happen not to be here. If you need access to the church building for anything, just call us. We'll come open the door for you and let you in. So use that as, as you see fit. Right now, Ike Williams is going to come with an announcement. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the nominating committee. What the nominating committee does um, <clears throat> is we help to try to fill the various positions throughout the church, such as... Um, the other committees on the church and also the ministries and so we basically keep track of who's filling the committees and then we will make recommendations to the council to approve uh, who fills the committees. Now we used to have uh, our committees filled pretty well at this church several years ago but ever since I've been here uh, the, the church was pretty small in number up until about a year ago we started growing in number and now we're starting to get a lot of people becoming members of the church and we have people available to fill um, some of the committees that we have outlined in our constitution and our bylaws. So what are the various committees that are available out there to serve on? There's the finance committee, right now Dennis Pierman is on that committee. There's the nominating committee, like I said, that's my, myself, Jamie Williams, um, Tom Dowd, and Miss Adele Owens. And then we have the personnel committee um, which is vacant. The pastor care committee is vacant. The building and grounds committee that uh, consists of Richard Starry back there. There's the constitution committee that has some automatic uh, members, which are, are three people, Miss Adele, uh, uh, Richard Starry, and then a trustee, but that needs some more people too. We have a missions committee, which uh, consists of Carlos Ornelas, but there's no other members on that committee. Um, and then we have the trustees and then the fellowship committee, which is Sarah, and then I, I think you're the only one on the committee, right? And so I just listed a bunch of committees that are outlined in the Constitution and the bylaws, so those are opportunities for you to serve. And then there's also some ministries that are outlined in the bylaws. These, this includes the men's ministry, women's ministry, singles, youth, Awana, and then also we, those are the minimum ones we have. We also have other ministries like uh, like FBI, uh, Faith Bible Institute, which Carlos Ornelas has been running. But as a nominating committee, um, if you are interested in serving in any of those ministries or serving on one of those committees, talk to one of us, uh, myself or Jamie or Adele. Tom Dowd's on vacation right now, but he'll be back in January. I have a copy of the Constitution and Bylaws. In the Constitution and the Bylaws, they explain what what each one of those committees do. So if you, if one of those things sounds interesting to you, come talk to me and I can explain to you what the, what the committee is. So, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. We'll ask you to do that again next week and hopefully you'll have a quorum. <laughs> okay, right now I want to ask you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. There's much to pray about and uh, I want you to join me as we just worship the Lord through prayer. Father in heaven, Always a joy to come into your house on the Lord's Day to have your people here with us, to have your word before us. We just rejoice at every opportunity to come to the house of the Lord. We thank you for today. We thank you for those who are here. We know, Lord, we have so many who are absent today, traveling, perhaps out sick, uh, whatever the, the vacation time is upon us, and many are taking advantage of that. We pray for all of them that wherever they are in the world today, they will have time to pause and remember this is the Lord's Day, and they'll spend some time with you. And in some way you will bless them where they are just for their faithfulness and turning to you. For those of us who are here today, Lord, we just anticipate a blessing. You always meet us here and bless us. And we anticipate that happening again today. And we thank you in advance for all that we're going to receive today, Lord, because you're so good to us. 
Thank you so much for this season we're going through, the celebration of the birth of your son, Jesus, the transition into a new year, a year of new opportunities, new mission endeavors, perhaps. Uh, who knows what 2015 holds for us? You know, and we just look forward again to having a great year here as a church, doing the things you give us to do, and blessing people and being blessed by you. Father, we do pray for our people who are sick. It's so good to see some in church today who have been really ill, and we thank you for that, for the healing mercies you've showed to them. And uh, Lord, there are others out there who may be sick. We don't think the, the flu season is over yet, so we pray for all our people here at church. You just put a hand of protection on us all and keep us safe and, and strong and healthy as we go forward. Uh, Lord, we pray for churches around the world today. Wherever your word is being taught in spirit and in truth, people come to worship you. We pray that the power of heaven will come down on those places and you'll do great things am amongst your people today. And we'll all be able to leave church at the end of the service saying, did you see what God did at church today? Something awesome happened just because of the presence of the Lord. We thank you for all that you let us be, Lord, all you've given us in Jesus, all you let us do in his service. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in a moment, you're going to stand up to greet each other, and then you're going to come back to singing. So a little emphasis for singing here in Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. We should be praising God 24-7, those of us who know him as our personal Lord and Savior. Stand up, shake hands with people, make everybody feel welcome in the church of, uh, house of God today. Sing this with us as you return to your seats this morning. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. Lord, I love to sing your praise. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you came to save us. I'm so glad you came. To, you came to save us. You came from Lord, I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name. 
sing that one more time. Lord, I lift your name. Lord, I lift your name on high. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. The speed restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sorrow, still we are the voice in the desert crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, a shining like the sun. The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. The fields are as wide as the world. And we are the laborers in your Declaring the word of the Lord Behold he comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun At the trumpet call So lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee And out of Zion to salvation Come behold, behold he comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun at the trumpet call, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. There is no God like Jehovah. 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 Glory, glory to the Lamb. You 
take me into the land. A hill, hill, line of Judah How powerful you are A hill, hill, line of Judah How powerful you are A hill, Jesus, you're my king Glory, glory to the Lamb. You take me into the land. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail, line of Judah. Hail, hail, line of Judah, how wonderful you are, how wonderful you are. We're going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time to collect the morning offering. Please remain standing as we're going to continue to worship.
makes a worship with us this morning. Please be seated. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in that wonderful time of worship. Children's church can be dismissed at this time. That's all the little children age three through kindergarten can go upstairs, and there's someone there to greet you and take care of you. While you're going, let me ask you, did you get everything you wanted for Christmas, you guys? <laughs> did everybody make out okay? I hope everybody got something good. I got a note from my wife saying, I'm not going to tell you anymore to pull your pants up. She's been so concerned the last two or three years I'm going to lose my pants. And, um, and I was happy about that. I don't like her telling me to pull up my pants. And I dug a little deeper in the box and found out I had two new pair of suspenders as one of my Christmas gifts. So there you go. When you see me fumbling inside my shirt like this doing that, I'm not lifting up a bra strap. I'm about to lose my suspenders, and uh, I want you to know that, too. There's a difference. Okay, um, I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, you know that pesky thing we do every year about this time, making New Year's resolutions? You've probably already been formulating yours, and you may even have promised yourself a few things. You've resolved to do some stuff, and you know from past experience that's going to last till somewhere last latter part of January. <laughs> and then it's going to probably fade away in most people's lives. You're going to forget all about it. I want to talk to you today about a New Year's resolution that will work for you. Most of our resolutions from time to time have to do with diet, don't they? Well, I want to share with you today a, a New Year's diet that will work. I guarantee it. Uh, on Wednesday morning, I flipped on TV and had on the Fox News Network. Uh, the Hannity show was on, and Sean Hannity was interviewing the cable guy. You all know the cable guy? He was being interviewed, and Hannity asked him about uh, New Year's resolutions, and he started laughing, and he started talking and making jokes about all the resolutions he'd made in the past and how he had broken them before. He got past much, usually the New Year's celebration. He'd already broken all his resolutions. And he said, this year, Sean, I've made one keep. I assure you I'm going to keep this New Year's resolution this year. And Hannity said, what is it? He said, I resolve that between now and the end of March, I'm going to lose 15 grams of weight. No, 15 milligrams. 15 milligrams of weight. Now, you know, I'm not from a metric background. I had to look that up. And 15 milligrams is uh, it's dot four zeros five two nine. I think it's a, you can put that much in. I wouldn't even know you had it in there. That's how small it is. So he's, made, he's finally found a resolution he can make and keep. He's going to lose 15 milligrams between now and the end of uh, March. Well, he'll probably succeed with that one. You and I always are making these resolutions. And we make them with the best of intentions. Then we break them the first time temptation or something comes along. I'm not going to tell you about the ones I've made for this coming year. I don't want you to know when I stumble and fall. Proof that I have lied to myself. <laughs> I want to share with you today, and uh, I'm very much aware we have like only half a congregation here today. I'm really glad you're here. I'm sorry the other half are going to miss this. If I get too carried away in the first part, this may morph into a two part sermon. We'll get the, I don't know, we'll try to get through today, but if I don't, we'll have the second half next Sunday. You'll get it all. There's a verse of scripture found in Jeremiah chapter 15, a marvelous verse of scripture. The first time I encountered it, I stopped right. The Lord dealt with me deeply about this verse of Scripture. I committed it to memory, and I carry it in my memory to this day. I want you to memorize it. I want you to memorize this verse of Scripture for your own good, and I want you to remember it always, and I want you to be able to quote it to yourself when you need to. It says very simply this. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Pray with me. Father. I know most Christians in my acquaintance need 
a Jeremiah experience such as is expressed right here in this simple verse of Scripture. And I'm praying that somehow you'll use the poor words of this preacher today to motivate people to do what Jeremiah did and to have the experience that he had as a result of what he did as stated here in this simple verse. Lord, we need you. We need to hear from you. We need to know you. And you've given us a book where those things are provided. We just need to discover it and then go from there. But I pray you'll move us in that direction today, Lord. We need you to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you love going to the post office and getting mail from home. You love getting letters from people who love you, writing to remind you. Maybe it's just checking your email, or maybe it's, I don't know how you get your communication from home. Anymore. Your mail call, when I went in the Air Force, mail call was a big thing. You still stood in a formation and had your mail handed to you. That was a big deal, because that's ancient history, I know. But getting mail from home from someone who loves you is a good thing. When you and I pick up a book that says Holy Bible on the front of it, I want you to know we have, if we're Christians, we have a love letter from home. God, our Father, has written to us and told us about His love for us. And you and I need to read that love letter. We need to let that love letter percolate in our hearts and minds and in our souls and have an effect upon us because it is meant to have an effect. It's not meant to just be read and laid down and dismissed. It's written to change our lives every time we encounter it. And we need to do what Jeremiah did. Now, um, he, he, he's on a spiritual diet plan here, and I'm going to recommend this one to you for 2015. Try it for a while. Try it for a full year. And if you do it for a full year, you will get to a place where you enjoy it so much you'll never quit. It will become a habit, and you'll feel like your day is not complete if you don't do this. Why is it important for God's children, once you're already saved, to spend time regularly in God's Word, devouring it, ingesting it, just getting it into your system? There is a thing in science, a, a thing called entropy. Uh, John Ortberg, he's a Presbyterian preacher. I have forgiven for being in the wrong denomination. You're a great writer. Uh, he he uh, reflected on what is one of the greatest enemies of the human spirit and he came to the word he invited a man named Max Dupre, Dupre who was the CBO of a Fortune 500 company uh, he's written classic books on leadership he's anchored the board of trustees at Fuller Seminary <coughs> for over 40 years to uh, speak character building that kind of thing and that people have to work on all the time. And Dupre answered, it is entropy. Entropy. From the, uh, that has something to do with the second law of thermodynamics, the availability of energy. It speaks to the fact that the universe is winding down. And what it literally means is that anything natural left to its own devices will begin to diminish, deteriorate, and eventually waste away. And Max Dupre told John Ortberg, that is the enemy of the human spirit. The, the spiritual enemy of Christian spirits is entropy. If, they just, if people just get saved and then just kick it into neutral, their relationship with the Lord will begin to deteriorate and to diminish. Their zeal for the Lord will begin to fade away. Entropy will take place. Uh, the definition, the, the dictionary definition, a process of degeneration marked variously by increasing degrees of uncertainty, disorder, fragmentation, chaos. Specifically, such a process regarded as the inevitable terminal stage in the life of a social system or a structure. You and I face a parallel spiritual entropy. Our zeal for the Lord, our love for the Lord. Yeah, you may have seen this yourself. People make a profession of faith. They come forward in a church, make it public. They follow the Lord Jesus in spiritual baptism. And for a while, they are running hot. I mean, they're hitting on all cylinders. They're so in love with the Lord. But you come back a year later and take a look at them, or two years later, you say, well, I wonder what happened to that person who was so filled with joy when they first got saved. It seems to have grown lukewarm. And, you know, John, the, uh, the, the apostle, wrote about lukewarmness in the churches uh, in the book of Revelation. It's because spiritual entropy has set in. They haven't done the right things. A wrong diet 
You see, the human spirit is going to be taking in impulses all the time. There's no way you and I can just become numb to where we get no influence from outside. We're going to be getting influenced by something all of the time. An entropy will set in if we're not getting filled with the right kind of impulses. So we need to do what Jeremiah did. And I'm going to share that with you in detail in just a moment. We need to do what Jeremiah did. We need to make sure we're getting some of the right input from the right source so that entropy cannot happen. In, instead, development and growth will happen and we'll be moving upward in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, the proper diet plan for you having to do with this verse of Scripture, I'm going to lay out some things. You probably know this from some of your junior high school, whatever. I'm going to just lay out some things. Now, let me say something here. You know, they say best about stuff they know a lot about. I know a lot about eating. So I hope you're braced for a really good sermon here. Because <laughs> I know a lot about this subject. First of all, discover the right nourishment. In our society, especially in, in America and Western Europe, fast food has pretty much taken over sensible eating. We go where it's quick and easy and hopefully cheap. And we don't worry too much about what we're getting in the way of nutrition. Just fill the void down here and make me feel good and I'll be okay. And we'll let the system deal with all the pollution stuff I'm taking in. Now, discover the right diet plan. Uh, I, I did a lot of research about this stuff, you know, and all kinds of articles about how fad diets don't work. Well, yeah, fad diets. Don't say, okay, I'm going to do this for 30 days and then uh, give it up. No, you need something you can, you can continue. Discover a diet plan that works. What, are, what is the right stuff to put in my system that will, uh, that will be the enemy of entropy and be the friend of development and growth and maturity? It's in the pages of God's holy word. Your words were found. He discovered something good for him. And he began to make that his diet. If you have found what's the right stuff to eat, then you devour it. Another word for this is ingest, but I couldn't get all enough words to start with the same letter, so I devour. Don't nibble on God's word. Devour it. Get yourself some big old healthy helpings of God's holy word. Eat this stuff. I like the way the, the original King James Version puts it here. Thy words were found and I did eat them. <laughs> it seems to add an extra emphasis to it. I ate them. Devour God's word. Be hungry for a message from God all the time. Always open this Bible with an expectation. Today when I look on those sacred pages, I'm going to see something there that God, my Father, has prepared for me and He set the table. When I open it up, there it is. And God's going to bless me out of that Bible today. And I'm just going to eat it. I'm just going to just, just take it in and just swallow it and just let it become part of who I am. That's why the devotion I write, I call them digging a little deeper. I'm afraid we've got too many biblical snackers in the Christian church in, in, in the world today. We need people who, sit, who will sit down and feast on God's word. Now, what, when I say feast, what do I mean? Do I, do I mean read uh, five pages or ten pages or read a whole book in a setting? No, I don't mean that at all. I mean feast. You may open the Bible and the first verse you read may just say, whoa. Stop right there. If, 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 if the Spirit of God says to you, oh, this is good, stop right here. When I came to Jeremiah 15, 16, the first time I was reading through the Bible, I, I, I couldn't go any further. I had to stop and reflect on what that said. Because it seems so special to me. You find a verse of scripture and it just kind of raises up off the page. And, 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 and the Holy Spirit of God is saying, that is something good I prepared for you. Stop right there. Don't go rushing on. <laughs> just stop right there. And devour what that says. Think on it. Meditate on it. Ask God about it. Lord, what does this mean to me? He's there. He'll answer you. He'll tell you. He'll help you understand. You may get a feast in one verse of Scripture. You may have to read a whole chapter. You may have to read five pages. There's no set pr uh, procedure no, about how much you have to read. Just when you find something that is really good, it speaks to your heart, stop right there and feed on that. Eat it. Internalize it. Say, Lord, thank you for cooking that up for me. I needed that today. What a wonderful thing. It's a special thing. And you, you need to make that a habit. 
Don't go running through the Bible like you're in a race. Nobody's chasing you. Nobody's going to outread you. Uh, you're doing fine. Devi de discover it, devour it, and then digest it. I think sometimes this becomes one of the hard parts for Christian people. We're in too big a hurry. First of all, we don't have time to sit and reflect on the verse of Scripture that seems to speak to us. And then when we get it, we, we sit and reflect on it all in, and we go in for when it comes down into your system, the system has got to begin to break it down and, and put it in places where it wants it and, and make it effective in your life. The Word of God is meant to change people's lives. It's meant to give you something you didn't have before, and you need to let it get in there, and then you need to spread it out. How does this apply to me? I see what it says. It brings joy to my heart. I love it, but how does this apply to me? Where is this supposed to go in my life? What's it supposed to do when it gets there? God has an answer to those questions. You know, when you know the author of a book, it makes it so much more fun to read it, you know. And when you know that author loves you and wrote this with you in mind, it makes it that much more special. So digest God's word. And then I, the next word I use, uh, I like this, deploy. Put it to work. Uh, deploy, you know, uh, I went to the, I, I know what it means, but I want to see what the really smart people say about it. So I went to the dictionary forces, equipment, etc., in accordance with a battle plan. At, at this point, in the digestive system, and we're, we're talking about metabolizing now. But I like the word deploy. Because you see, the Bible tells us you and I are involved in spiritual warfare. And so we've got to get the resources that God gives us from the pages of this great book. We've got to get them in a place where they can help us fight the battles that are coming against us. Deploy. Okay, Lord, I understand this. You're telling me that, and you know, I encounter this situation or that situation, and I think what this verse of Scripture says here will help me, and I'm going to remember this next time that temptation or that trial or that persecution, whatever comes my way, I'm going to remember this verse of Scripture. I'm going to put it to work right there. I'm going to use it. Now, the fifth thing, discover, devour, digest, deploy, develop. And here is where truly most modern Christians fall way short. I've, I've said this several times here since I've been preaching in this church because as long as I've been here, I've said several things several times. Uh, I used to get, get called to preach revivals back in the States, and one of the sermons I'd almost always take with me, I'd call it being a fat cat Christian in a lean and hungry world. And I would talk about people who sit out there where you're sitting taking in everything that comes from a pulpit, everything that comes from a music team. You, you read your Bible, you just sit there, and you just you, you discover, you devour, you digest, and you just grow fatter and fatter and fatter spiritually. But you know what happens if you just eat, 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 and eat and never do any exercise? <laughs> You're looking at a living word picture right here. No, you get fat, 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 and you don't want to do that. Once you've got this into your system... You want to develop it into something that will do good. So you have to take what you've learned from God's Word and put it to work in the world around you. You learn something, then use it. Develop it. Uh, up to this point in time, you see, almost everything we've talked about, these first four Ds are just things that the Holy Spirit of God will do for you if you allow Him to do it. But when you get down to develop, now you have got to get up and get to work. Maybe you need to get somebody on the phone or you need to uh, text somebody or you need to email somebody or Skype somebody or whatever you do and tell somebody what God's Word said to you today. You never know what the person out there may be needing. They may have the same need you have and God may know that. He may have given you this to share with someone else. Put it to work. Develop. Flex those muscles. Oh, at our house, man, we're putting our exercise room together. Got the weight set, broke down. I'm ready to move it. I, I got some people been coaching me about what to do, you know. And, and we're setting up a, an exercise room at the house. My wife's been insisting on it now for months. We'll see. Um, we, we, we're getting vigorous about this thing. We're going to have a way where we can burn off. So, you know, we, we, we keep on eating and digesting and, and all this stuff, and now we're going to develop some of it. We're going to get physical. We need to do that. There's a guy named Michael Josephson. Heads up an organization called Character Counts. And he shows up often in a little Christian newsletter I get daily, usually the one that comes for the weekends called uh, Weekend Encounter. Uh, he talks about 
the whole issue of success. I understand his account. Joseph's an expert in that. He, he writes in this one article that I got just this past Saturday, or Friday, I should say. He talks about how human beings define success, and you and I sitting here thinking, you know, if we had as much money as Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or something like that, we'd be successful. If we were as popular as some great movie star or recording artist, what if we'd be successful? And Josephson breaks it down and says, okay, those are preliminary measurements to success, but it's amazing how many people achieve those things and still feel totally unsuccessful because in some great way they're insignificant. It begins to define success as being significant. It's not being rich. It's not being popular. Success is when you become significant in someone's life. I can tell you from the responses I've got from Moldova and from Romania, there are people in this church who have been very significant in someone's life in those countries where we've sent money to help them with their needs. Josephson goes ahead to write, Feeling successful can generate satisfying emotions of self-worth, but feeling significant that one's life really matters is much more potent. Peter Drucker, the great manager, management guru, captured the idea when he wrote of the urge many high achievers have to, quote, move beyond success to significance. Become significant. Now let me tell you, as a Christian person, you don't have to have millions or billions of dollars. You don't have to be known and admired by 50 million people. You don't even have to have a thousand friends in your Facebook thingy to be successful. You can be significant right where you are. He went ahead to write, the surprise for many is that one of the surest roads to significance is service. It doesn't have to be a Mother Teresa missionary variety. Parents who sacrifice their own comfort and pleasure for their children are performing service, as are teachers, public safety professionals, members of the military, volunteers who work for the common good. And then he quotes Albert Schweitzer, who spoke at a, a graduation ceremony one time. I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know. The only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. You discover God's word. You devour it. You digest it. You deploy it. Now do something to develop it. Use it to benefit someone else. When you're sharing God's word with people, you're benefiting them. They may not recognize it at the moment, but you're benefiting them in some tremendous way. And you're being significant to them. So that is for you. That's the diet plan. Discover God's word. Get into the Holy Bible. Lord, what do you have for me today? Show me something special. And, and God will do that. When you take the proper diet, there are some promised diet results that will follow. And it's right here in our text. I ate them and your word. And now, listen, I, I want to play with this just a moment here. I, I, I'm, I'm, when I read the Bible, I pay close attention to the words that the Holy Spirit has used to convey his message. It starts out by saying your words, plural, were found. And I ate them. And your word, singular, was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Now, here's the thing. You have the Bible, you have God's holy word, singular. You open it up and you have pages filled with words, plural. That could be one application of what's being said there. It's a natural, simple thing to understand, and most people have no trouble with it. But I also can't read that without remembering how the Bible says that Jesus is the word, singular. And I can't forget the time when I heard uh, a great pastor from Memphis, Tennessee say, you can find Jesus on every page of the Holy Bible. I'm not sure I'm there yet, but I can find him in a lot of places. I, I love telling people that this book is God's written word, which reveals his living word, Jesus Christ. So I believe as Jeremiah was devouring, eating the words of God, he came to understand there's one coming one day who will be the living word of God, and it is in that that he began to joy, have joy and rejoicing. So one of the things we can count on is joy. Now, he has the words joy and rejoicing. I want to kind of try to see if I can make just a minimal differentiation between the two for you. Joy, I see that as being an internal thing, something you feel on the inside. It just bubbles up inside you, joy. You're just filled with it. It's, it's internal and, and basically invisible. 
something you're experiencing, but nobody else gets in on very much. Uh, I have a verse of scripture, <laughs> Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I got 32 sweet teeth in my mouth. How many of you got? Almost everybody I know has at least one sweet tooth. I got 32 of those things. At, at last count, I, I think that's how, anyway. And tasting something sweet makes me feel good. I get joy. I'm a chocoholic. I'll let you know that right up front. I'm a chocoholic. I love it. it. It brings joy, but it's an internal thing. But then there's also rejoicing, external, visible. You see, you got joy inside you. If you hold it there, nothing's going to happen. But if you rejoice, you let it out, then it becomes visible. People are going to see it. And joy and rejoicing can become contagious to people around you. And we ought to bring it out all the time. Now, I have a verse of Scripture here. In Luke chapter 10, verse 21... Uh, speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ, here's what it says. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. So this is an internal thing, okay? He's rejoicing inside himself. I said joy is internal, rejoicing. But listen what happens next. And said, I thank you, Father, <laughs> Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, revealed them to babes, even so, Father, for it so seemed good in your sight. He felt the joy inside him, expressed it. Thank you, Father. So joy turned into rejoicing. What was internal became external. What was invisible became visible, audible. People around him could hear. He's praising and his, his father and he's rejoicing. There are two things of this new diet, this diet for 2015. You, you discover God's word, you devour it, you, you deploy it, you develop it, and you begin to be filled with joy because you begin to see things that God is doing in your life through the, the word he has given you through his, the Holy Bible. And then, of course, you eat the right stuff long enough, you have life. You have life. It's not here in this verse exactly, but life, uh, the Bible speaks of it often. Psalm 119.50, this is my comfort, my affliction, for your word has given me life. Psalm 119.93, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. If you read the 119th Psalm, all 176 verses, you'll find that Every verse in it except two have some word that's a synonym for word. <laughs> and you know, like judgments, commandments, word, precepts, that's a, a synonym for word. So the, the psalmist is finding life in the word of God. And uh, in Philippians 2.16, Paul writes, holding fast the word of life. This book brings life to people who will devour it, digest it, deploy it, and develop it. It's an important, important thing. You get life. Life is both internal and external. You have it within you. The world around you can see it. It's eternal. It's indivisible. It's never going to change. I love telling people the moment you get saved, you don't have to wait to die to begin enjoying eternal life. You begin to enjoy eternal life the moment you bring Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Eternal life begins right then. So this life is indivisible. Yeah, there's going to be a little tweak in there somewhere where you're going to your spirit's going to leave this place and go to another place. But the life does not change. It's not divided into two compartments. It's one big old eternal life. And you need to get it from God's holy word. I don't know anybody or anything that cannot be improved miraculously, astronomically by spending time daily in the word of God. You have to have a proper appreciation of what it is. God's love letter to you. You have to understand, if it says that God handed it down through um, holy men of old who took the words they were given and wrote them down, accept it as that and don't let anybody outside the church, outside the Christian family, argue you out of that belief. This is God's holy word. Uh, Larry King, August of this year, uh, on the Larry King Show, he had a panel of guests who were discussing the future of faith in America. Now listen, when I was your age, that was never a question. Faith was as a as Chevrolet and apple pie and Coca-Cola. You know what I'm saying? Faith was a... Everybody had some. Now there's a, there are actually discussions. How long is it going to last in our nation? Uh, two of the guests uh, voiced the Holy Bible. One of them was a guy, uh, Lawrence Krauss, he, uh, uh, an atheist and a scientist. He quipped, the Bible was written basically before anything. Well, uh... Mr. Krauss, I'd like to ask you, have you 
read the Bible? Have you seen those things that were written in there hundreds of years before science knew anything? Things that are revealed about our natural world that you people didn't know until up into the medieval times or later. There, a thousand years before Jesus was born, somebody knew about them. It took you all a thousand years to discover it, and you're saying, we knew nothing. <laughs> how, did, how did the psalmist write that the world is round? I mean, 1492 people didn't know the world was round. <laughs> and there are still some people argue, is it flat or round? You know, somebody knew. Job reveals things in, in the book of Job that sci it took scientists 2,000 years to discover. And they revealed on the pages of the Holy Bible. This scientist, this so-called wise guy, he knew nothing uh, until years after, decades, actually millennia after it was written. Another guy, now this one really disturbed me. Bible, uh, Michael Beckwith, a self-proclaimed new thought minister added, the Bible to me is an evolution of human consciousness. It's an evolution. It's not something that was fixed the moment it was written. It's something that's been changed down through the... Uh, that is such a pathetic point of view. We don't call it the Word of God. We call it people who were inspired by the presence of God. And in that case, the God is a little G, not a capital G. We don't call it the Word of God. We call it people who were inspired just by the presence of God. Well, you can get anything out of a situation like that, can't you? You have got to understand, this book is not junk food, folks. This is not something that comes off the food line at a fast food production place. This is something that God took centuries to prepare, centuries to pass down, and for centuries has defended it, held it up to be true, has proven it to be true time after time after time against all kinds of struggles, all kinds of challenges. This book has always come out as being true, true, true. No one has yet ever disproved any portion of the Holy Bible. Understand that. They will say that they have but they're lying when they do it. This word is filled with all the nutrition that the soul needs. Uh, there, there are verses you've probably known about. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So for the new, newborn babe in Christ, it's milk. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, 2, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now you're still not able. It's, it's intended to start out as milk for the newborn baby, but turn into solid food. As you mature and begin to understand more, it becomes good, solid food. Paul was writing to some, to some Christians who had never developed to that point. And I, so help me, I've known. I've served in churches back in the States where people have been members of that church for 50 years. They're still... Maturity-wise, babes in Christ because they never moved beyond what they knew the day they got saved. Because they haven't been eating God's word the way they should have. Uh, Hebrews 5, 12, and 13 says kind of the same thing. Milk, meat, uh, solid food. It's all those things to everyone. It's not junk food. It's not made up of a bunch of synthetic junk. It's, it's, it's God's wholesome home cooking. Now, let me just close very quickly by talking to you about, I talked to you about uh, the, the proper diet plan, the promises of the diet plan, the priority of the diet plan is saying here in our verse of scripture, I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Ask yourself, who am I? What is my eternal name? Is it Christian? Am I truly called by God's name? Am I one of his people? Have I repented of my sins? Have I turned from that life that was going to take me to, to hell for eternity? Have I turned toward the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, repenting of my sins, ask him into my heart? Am I truly called by God's name? And if so, this is your priority, to eat what your dad in heaven has cooked for you. It's good, it's wholesome, it's delicious, it's nutritious, it's everything. I am called by your name. Home cooking will always be the best. <laughs> and I think you probably agree with that. I, I, my wife has turned out to be a great cook, and the stuff she does best is stuff she learned to do from my maternal grandmother. <laughs> Home cooking. I love it. 
I get back to Kentucky, I become a fool every time I go back there. because I hadn't seen this kind of stuff for ages. And said, get out of my way, stand back, I'm going to eat. Home cooking. God cooked this for his children. And it's better than anything anyone else had ever prepared for you. That's the priority. The word was joy and rejoicing in the heart of Jeremiah because Jeremiah is one of God's own. Aren't you? If you are, then this is for you, and this will bring to you joy and rejoicing just as it did to Jeremiah. Now, let me tell you this. If you go back and, you know, the whole thing about context, if you go back into Jeremiah 15, read the verses before verse 16 and the verses after it, you'll find out Jeremiah was at a very bad place in his life at the time this verse jumped up in, in his heart and mind. He just stuck it in around the middle of what seemed like a bunch of misery. And what he's saying is, in the midst of all that I'm going through, your words were found. And I ate them. And your word, I discovered him through this. It was the joy and rejoicing of my heart because I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. This is the spiritual diet plan. And I want to challenge everyone in this room today. Memorize Jeremiah 15, 16. Get it down in your heart so you can just stand up and spit it out anytime you need to. Turn to it and look at it from time to time. And then make it a point to practice what's here. Sometime every day, get yourself in a place where you can spend a few minutes looking into this book. Discover the good stuff that's here. Devour it. Digest it. Let it work in you to create something good. Bring it to bear on the situations of life. You know, you, we all have situations, and they're not going to change. We're all confronted with circumstances. It's going to always be that way. God has an answer for every situation and every circumstance. Find it. Apply it to those circumstances. And then share it with somebody else. Develop those spiritual muscles by telling people what God's Word has done for you. That's a diet plan, friends, that will work. It will work. And it will change all of our hearts, all of our lives. It will make us a more joyful people, a more productive people in the service of our Lord. This is something God gave you. Good, old-fashioned home cooking for the spirits of his children. Father, thank you today for the Holy Bible. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who put it into the hearts of some 40 men from all kinds of different backgrounds, walks of life, socioeconomic statuses. Thank you for inspiring those men to write this book. Thank you that they were faithful to the word. They brought it to us in written form. You have preserved it down through the centuries against all manner of opposition. Thank you for the Holy Bible. Thank you for how it is your love letter to us. Lord, how much you want us to know the depth of your love, the breadth of it, the length the breadth of your love for us. Thank you for the Bible. Help us, Lord, to appreciate it more to you. More time in empowering you get it out, Lord, around us, comes in life. Oh, thank you, Lord, for giving us this precious book. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to challenge you this morning. If you're here and you cannot say, I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. If you're not saved, you can't say that. And I want to challenge you this morning. Consider the life you're living. What is there so good about it that you betrayed heaven to be able to continue living this way? If you're a sensible person, you realize there's nothing so good here on this earth that I'd give up heaven for that. And you'll turn your back on that and you'll say, no, I want what God has for me. I don't want just what I can get for myself. I want what God has for me. So I want to turn away from that life of sin. I want to turn to a life that pleases God. I want to invite Jesus to forgive me all the mistakes of my past, present, and future and to make me a child of God. I want to be called by God's name. Make that decision right now. Then come and share that with us as we close our service. We want to rejoice with you over the victory that's coming into your life. And we ask you to do that. You may be here as a Christian. You know you're saved. You have no doubt about that. But you've experienced some spiritual entropy. You haven't paid much attention to God's Word. Your relationship with the Lord Jesus has grown lukewarm. It's kind of a so-so Christianity. Don't settle for so-so. It's so easy in life to settle for the mediocre. Don't do that. God doesn't want mediocrity for his children. He wants you to have... Uh, life and to have it more abundantly John 10 10 says come and kneel at this altar here just come and kneel and just talk to the Lord say Lord I'm going to dust it off and get it bright and fresh again and I don't ever want entropy again I want to develop it I want it to grow I want my relationship with you, with you to get better day by day 
We'll talk with you about church membership, special prayers and your uh, needs in your life. We'll talk with you about that. So as we sing our hymn of decision, you come, let the Holy Spirit of God tell you what to do, then you obey that. We're here to help you and to rejoice with you over the victory that the Lord will bring into your life this very moment. Let's stand, please. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. We challenge you, come on now. This is your time. Go with me. I still will follow. No, none go with me. I still will follow. No, none go with me. I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back. seated for a moment, would you please? Stand right here with me, please. Derek and Tara Gould have been attending our church for several months now, and uh, they've been a tremendous blessing to us. We've got two precious little kids out there somewhere. We're getting four today for the price of two. Isn't that good? Uh, <laughs> we always like that. They're coming on transfer of uh, membership from a church in San Antonio. Texas, and we're just rejoicing. that, Like I said, they've been a blessing already. They've just become part of the family, so we're so happy today to see them make this official. Uh, and we want you to welcome them to our fellowship with a great big Aviano Baptist. Amen. There you go. Uh, you can finish the paperwork if you want to. Uh, important, meet me out in the uh, Welcome Center right after service. Tiana? This is a young lady who's also been coming for a few months, and she has become a joy to us, just a, a special blessing. Her name is Tiana Roberts. Uh, she shared with me that she was saved two or three years ago, but because of moving around military, she never followed the Lord in scriptural baptism. So she's here today to present herself as a candidate for baptism on profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And she wants to do this next Sunday because that's January 4th. Her birthday is January 6th, so she wants to be baptized. And we're going to do that for her. So, uh, again, welcome Tiana with a great big Aviana Baptist. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the family. Uh, we're glad to have you. Um, g give them as much information as you can and head on out to the Welcome Center so they can greet you and rejoice with you over the decisions you've made. What a joy to be in the house of the Lord today. Thank you so much. Uh, Willie and the team are going to lead you in a happy song to get a smile on your face, a song on your heart as you go out. So go your way rejoicing. Uh, tell somebody why you're so happy. It's all because of Christ in your heart. See if you can get somebody out there interested in making the same decision you made once upon a time.
All right, um, we, uh, stand with us as, as we get ready to go. Uh, we introduced this to you over the last couple of weeks. This is an a cappella uh, little, little uh, praise chorus here. It says, Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say wait, wait upon the Lord. Wait, I say wait, we will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Let's sing that one more time. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say wait, wait upon the Lord. Wait, I say wait. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday.